I'm, <clears throat> I'm definitely regretting not spray painting my beard into rainbow colors. Because I think, clearly, I'm a little bit behind on the fashion sense. Um, so this is actually a story of failure. This is a story of, you know, one of the things that I was most excited about, one of the times when I thought I'd really figured something out that was going to make a huge difference in the world, and then it didn't. Um, but hopefully it's useful. Um, it certainly turned out to be useful for us, and there may be things that, uh, that, that, that you find interesting in that. Anyway, so I care a lot about removing friction. You know, um, lots of people get to change the world in all sorts of interesting ways. There are probably people here who have invented something or designed something that is having a huge impact anywhere in the world. Um, and, and if you are sort of lucky enough to be focused on just one thing, I really think that's what you should try to do, right? You should focus on something that, that you can do amazingly well, that then lots of people will use, that changes the world in some great way, right? Um, the challenge for me is um, I, I have to try and work at a, at a much bigger scale. You know, I have a, a kind of an opportunity in life and a responsibility with it to, to think about things that really can have systemic impact. And I'm probably not smart enough to go and invent, you know, uh, a cure for some dread disease or something like that, right? So what I chose to do, what I chose to think about a lot, was how to make the world go faster um, by removing friction. And friction is a really kind of invisible cost. You know, if you think about it, you can see what you're trying to do and you're focused on what you're trying to do. You're not really focused on all the friction associated with getting there, right? Anyway, so probably the, the big thing that I've um, done that, that people know about or been part of that people know about um, is Ubuntu. And, you know, the core of the idea behind Ubuntu is very simple. It was saying, look, there are all of these brilliant people who are inventing tremendously useful um, uh, pieces of open source. But there's so much friction associated with people getting hold of that open source, right? that only a small part of the world can get access to it. And the world would go much faster in, in whatever direction it wants to go if we could make it um, easier for everybody to get access to whatever the brilliant open source is today. Right? So Ubuntu was all about removing friction. And I think, I think it worked. Right? Lots of people tell me that, that Ubuntu allows them to get access to open source very, very easily. Well, about Five years after we built the team that was making Ubuntu, I, I noticed a big change, right? The community, which was the people who were making these pieces of open source, who were all kinds of crazy in different ways, um, became industry. And so the scale of everything got amplified, right? Um, it went from being, for most people, kind of rebellious, activity that they did outside of uh, a work environment. It went to being what everybody did and what the big companies did as well. And so the whole dynamic really started to change. Um, also, GitHub happened, which is a really good thing. It accelerated the underlying dynamic, the drivers of open source, right? So suddenly, we saw an explosion in the amount of open source that was out there. Um, you know, I went yesterday to find a list of NoSQL databases, and I found an outdated list, which had 225 different NoSQL databases, right? All of which are in production somewhere, and there are many institutions that have lots of them in production, right? So we've seen this explosion in open source. In fact, if you think about it, companies used to be limited by what software they could find, right, or buy. Now, they're limited by what software they can operate. So the friction has moved. And writing ops code is friction. Now, that's a slightly awkward sort of statement to make for people who write ops code, right? And I caused a bit of a controversy here when I came in 2016 and said that in order to get to the future of configuration management, we have to stop doing it configuration management. But it's worse than that. We have to stop writing ops code, right? We have to obsolete it. It has to go away. 
And the reason for that is essentially exactly what Charity was talking about earlier, right? People are drowning in complexity, and most of that complexity is complexity that they create, right? Which is a really interesting and unexpected observation. Think about the code that companies write. Right? Think about the code that companies write, and think about the code that companies use. The vast majority of the code that companies use, they never look at. Even people who are super professional and super um, passionate about a piece of open source code may well have never looked at the code. I bet you there are people here who are fervent Emacs users who've never compiled Emacs, right? The thing about operations code, everybody writes all their own operations code. And so it's the last remaining place where we have these tangled webs of pre-0.1 code all over the place, right? All over the place. And that's friction. In the same way that getting open source onto people's laptops represented friction, getting open source into people's organizations has to go through the friction of getting operationalized, right? Code doesn't just magically start running itself. Um, it has to get operationalized, which means typically writing large amounts of code. And that can, code can only be written by people who've already written large amounts of code in that environment because it has to be integrated, right? That's why SaaS took off, because it didn't have to go through all that friction, right? If you could make your software available at a web URL, then suddenly click it could be operationalized without the ops people getting involved, right? That's also why Cloud SaaS is so popular because push a button and you've got a database. You don't have to worry about the ops code. So worrying about this, like in 2010, I thought, well, the answer is ops packaging. And wouldn't it be amazing if ops code could move around and be an artifact that people just consume and just write, and sorry, just run everywhere without even looking at it, just like they run Emacs everywhere without even looking at it, right? And so we worked on this for five years. It was really difficult. We were grappling with OpenStack. We were trying to find a great way to do OpenStack. And eventually we kind of got to the point where really it looked like it was working. So I thought, okay, this is something that we can share. This is something that it solves a real problem for people. And I kind of booked a whole bunch of conference speaking opportunities, including here, um, to talk about this great idea. Not so much. <laughs> Nobody cared. Nobody had the slightest bit of interest in this idea that ops code could be something that they could just drop in and run. In fact, that sounded like the worst idea ever, right? Because you have to understand what's happening in production on your own production systems. You have to understand every detail of what's happening in production on your own production systems. So I started to feel a little bit like this guy. This was my favorite book when I was about three. And it's about someone who goes around sort of saying, here's something really tasty, but nobody wants to taste it. Um, and so eventually after a while, we did get some people trying it, and what they found was bugs. Not so pretty bugs, right? Difficult bugs. And so after a while, I thought, okay, you know what? That was just a bad idea. You know, maybe it was interesting. Maybe it was, you know, lovely and elegant in its own way, but if nobody else wants this thing, we should just kill it. And so we started looking into essentially deploying OpenStack uh, with some of the other open source projects that were out there. And at the last minute, um, we'd hired someone uh, to work on OpenStack who was used to um, uh, those open source projects, um, open source Ansible. And that person said, you know, hold on a sec, actually. Yes, there are bugs. Yes, there are shortcomings. But at the end of the day, this is still a far nicer way to deploy and run OpenStack than anything else that's out there. So I thought, OK, we failed. We failed to get people excited about an idea. We failed to get people um, using something uh, new and different. Um, but if this team wants to keep using it, you know, they're important enough that they can use whatever they want to use. I think part of the challenge was that the thing that we were most focused on was OpenStack. And OpenStack is really, really hard, right? It brings together everything that's hard about physical operations 
with a bunch of things that are really interesting about distributed systems and complex systems, um, all of which uh, have lots of unknown unknowns in them. Um, but, the interesting, uh, uh, but an interesting thing started to happen. As OpenStack fell out of fashion, fewer and fewer people actually wanted to dive in and write their own automation for OpenStack. Fewer and fewer people felt that writing piles and piles of chef to run OpenStack inside their business was really exciting or really what they wanted to do, right? Most people started to think, well, that's going to be a lot of work, and then it's going to be really difficult, and then they'll kill the project, right? So we got asked to do more and more OpenStack. And an interesting thing happened when we stopped trying to push Juju, which was this packaging of operations. We stopped trying to push that as a product. And we only focused on using it for our own craft, right? Instead of trying to get features into a product, we basically said we're only going to work on issues that the people who are using it every day run into. And we're only going to focus on using it to be really, really good for OpenStack, because that's what we're using it for. So it moved from being kind of a product with a roadmap, with presentations and a whole sort of set of ideas around it, to simply being something that had to work for people who were using it at scale every day. Thanks, Aaron. <laughs> oh, I'm so going to get trolled. <laughs> And in a sense, <laughs> that's shit, I'm going to go turn that off right away. <laughs> <laughs> so, in a sense, it kind of became like open source always used to be, right? It was a small project that was just focused on by, by a couple of people who were actually using it every day. And it got disconnected from the world of the sort of intense pressure for developer advocacy that we were seeing as big business effectively came into open source, where everybody had to have the new big thing every, every week. And slowly, the number of open stack deployments that we had to do kept growing. And more interestingly, the time that it took to actually deploy open stack every time shrunk. And so we could get more and more confident about saying we could send fewer and fewer people for a shorter and shorter time with more and more certainty to do that complicated OpenStack thing, even though every OpenStack's different, right? They're all different sizes, they're all different scales, they're all different architectures. Even despite all of that, the time to deploy just kept uh, reducing. And a few other people started to show up. In, in the OpenStack world, initially, everybody wanted to own OpenStack, right? And so every company had their own OpenStack distribution. Even, you know, if you think about it, OpenStack has to pull together components from lots of different companies, right? Networking, storage, compute. So we thought, well, the best way to do that is to have this modular, pluggable, object-oriented approach. Um, and so we went to a bunch of companies and said, well, if you just worry about your object, your class effectively, then everybody else will worry about their piece and this will work out great. And they said, ha, 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 you don't understand. Companies that have bought our networking equipment are so screwed they can't buy anything from anyone else, so they're just going to buy OpenStack from us as well. We don't need to collaborate with anybody. Well, it turned out that didn't work, right? It turned out that companies actually did want best of breed pieces, right, from lots of different places. And so slowly, the other companies that have to deliver pieces into OpenStack found that this was actually a really useful way of doing it. And other crowds, other communities which have this problem of operating complex software right, started to join. There's a group called Open Source Mano, and it's, a, it's a, in the telco space. It's all about operating telco software, and they want to do that in a very cloud-friendly sort of way. So they started getting interested in all of this as well. And um, Tom Barber, Spicule, that um, I met here at Config Management Camp in 2016, he started to get interested in all of this for Hadoop as well. So slowly, this little community started to form. It was really just focused on super, super reusable operations. So I actually want to yield the mic to Tom just to talk for two minutes, five minutes, about Hadoop done this way.
folks. Um, so, yeah, I was here in 2016, and it was a bit different, because I was sat right back at the top in the back row lurking. Um, and um, the empty chair analogy was interesting, because um, when I was sat back at the back, I remember like, looking at everyone's laptops, and everyone was like, vast, like, absolutely amazed by this box on the desk. Everybody was looking at what the orange box was. Um, but it transpired that you know, the empty seat analogy worked pretty well. Uh, Mark failed to mention that um, they figured that they failed with Juju, um, and so we plowed on regardless. Uh, we're still going, we're still going. So um, I've been working with Juju stuff for three plus years now, uh, through one point something, through two, and on we go. Um, and as a business, we deal a lot with uh, data science projects. Um, we do a lot of work with NASA JPL, DARPA, um, the UK government and a few other, um, you know, large organisations. Uh, and one of the things that we do quite often is deploy Hadoop-based workloads um, and also into different clouds for different services for different people. Uh, and so everyone's requirements are a bit different, but we don't like having to, you know, repeat, um, repeat, um, keep coming up with the same thing over and over again. And so. When uh, Canonical introduced the charm stuff to us, um, it was interesting and something that we figured that we could take forward and leverage <laughs> ourselves by plugging in different bits, um, using the relations, the lines that join all these uh, lovely circles, um, into something bigger and you know, we could repurpose for our own use cases. Um, you know, so Juju allows us to build data applications um, to deploy into a range of mainstream clouds, and that's something that's big for us, being able to deploy into AWS, GCE, Azure, um, JPL, or a massive AWS shop. Um, but what we want to be able to do is provide the ability for uh, non-systems administrators, and I'm not trying to do all the SAs out of a job at this point, um, you know, uh, provide, them, provide data scientists with the ability to be able to deploy their own uh, you know, Hadoop-based workloads but without the vendor lock-in that you would get by deploying to you know, the um, Amazon uh, Elastic MapReduce or the, uh, the Google Compute bits and pieces. And so you know, Juju allows um, us as a business to provide the same uh, infrastructure to different, uh, to different businesses wanting to provide, um, you know, wanting to leverage uh, Hadoop support and build applications off on top of that. And so, you know, JPL, as a, as a good example, they use an awful lot of AWS. They use a lot of uh, Kubernetes, which I'm sure Mark will come on to in a bit. Um, you know, and they also deploy stuff to bare metal. And OpenStack, I believe, came from NASA originally. So, you know, OpenStack and Rackspace were, um, NASA and Rackspace were working on OpenStack. And so, you know, pulling these bits and pieces together to allow us to deploy um, workloads for research projects into different places um, works nicely and you know we thank uh, the work done at Canonical and the guys set up there um, you know in terms of making you know our lives easier in deploying this stuff um, into production. So that's kind of for me how a community gets built right people care about something people are good at something and people want to share something right so these Hadoop components, these Hadoop charms, are completely reusable for anybody in any environment who wants to stand up that stuff, right, in a way that is abstracted, in a way that is kind of shrink-wrapped, just like you can apt get some binaries, right, or docker run some artifact, you can now get the operations code as an artifact. And it's essentially shrink-wrapped, right? You can get in, it's like open source, you can get in and change it if you want to, but 99% of the time, you won't. So, basically we figured out that ops people live in two sorts of worlds. There are people who only work in their own data centers. And they tend to try to make a set of choices that then apply to everything in those data centers, right? They essentially have a corporate way of doing something. And in a sense, you're kind of a hostage to that corporate way of doing things, right? Because the way to get efficiency, it's thought, the way to get efficiency is to do everything the same way inside that data center. 
The other set of people are people who have to work in lots of different data centers. And they're people like integrators, consultants, resellers, right? They're people who essentially have to go into an environment that's foreign to them. They can't possibly understand all of the choices that have been made that are unique to that environment, right? And they have to be productive. They essentially have to get something done. And the faster they can get that done, the more reliably they can get that done, the better for them. And that really maps to the way this community has shifted, right? All of the people here are interested in effectively <coughs> delivering capabilities inside other people's environments. They have to essentially get their stuff working inside some other environment, and they can't control which cloud that's going to be on, which hypervisor that's going to be on, um, which version control system is going to be used, which log system is going to be used, which um, configuration management system is going to be used. And then along came Kubernetes. So we basically had hunkered down and we were continuing with Juju really because of OpenStack and because we had this community starting to form around Hadoop, right? And along came Kubernetes. And that was really easy. Turns out that essentially Kubernetes is just a bunch of pieces that need to be wired up uh, and they want to be essentially deployed at arbitrary scale on arbitrary clouds. So that was super easy. And it was super easy to do that in a way which worked on bare metal um, and on VMware and all the different public clouds. It challenged us in a new way though because Kubernetes is the first time we've seen a serious application which actually can integrate directly with cloud SaaS. If you think about it, Postgres, great piece of open source, been around a long time, it has absolutely no idea if it's running on Azure, Amazon or bare metal. Has no idea, right? Doesn't even know if it's running in a VM, doesn't care, right? But Kubernetes has all of these capabilities built into it to wire itself into, for example, load balances from the cloud. All the clouds have contributed to Kubernetes so that Kubernetes can be run using Elastic Load Balancer or the Microsoft <coughs> Load Balancer or the Google Load Balancer or, you know, lots of different clouds have wired that up. So we extended the modeling capability to have essentially a, a charm which proxies for services provided by the cloud. So this now allowed us to deploy a standardized Kubernetes. So here you essentially have the same Kubernetes, the same way to stand it up, the same way to scale it, the same way to operate it, the same binaries, the same upgrade mechanism, the same security mechanisms, all of those things in every different cloud environment. But done this way, you have to, in that model, provide your own load balancer and your own storage primitives and so on backed, backed onto that cloud environment. This essentially said, okay, we can link through this integrator charm, we can link to the cloud SaaS so that Kubernetes can get programmed to essentially use the Azure load balancer or the Google load balancer or the Amazon load balancer dynamically in the model. So again, the same operations code being used, but optionally wiring into those services. So where are we now? What's happened recently? Well, here are things we've learned. First, there's a difference between modeling and orchestration. And I never really understood this. For years, I never really understood this. Orchestration, modeling seemed like the same sort of word, two words for the same thing. But it actually turns out that modeling is essentially the act of making things work independent of scale, right? It's like topology to mathematicians. It, a cup and a donut are sort of the same thing, right, from a modeling point of view, right? One hole through the body, right? But orchestration is very much about understanding what's going on all around that thing and therefore what the attributes of that thing has to be. So you could build the same model Right? and do it HA or not HA. You could do it on big machines or on little machines. You could do it on bare metal or you could do it on VMware. Right? And it would be an orchestrator that would decide that. So one of the things we now see is that there's a whole cottage industry growing up for people essentially building orchestrators that understand business problems, right? And they're making decisions like which cloud should I put that on or which um, substrate should I put that on or should I make it a big model or a little model, should I use big machines or little machines? but they can use a common modeling language in Juju. The other thing that we've learned is 
The term model driven is misleading. Lots of people, we started using the term model driven and then I started seeing it sort of everywhere. And when I started digging into what people meant by model driven, it really meant they had a script. It really meant deploy with code, right? It meant that essentially they had some software and in that software there were variables and those variables were the model. And they could run that software with the right variables and they would get a deployment in production. But here's the problem with that. It still leaves you in a world where every company's modeling language and environment variables are completely different. And so it leaves you in a world where you can't just take code that works from one building and run it in a different building. Because all of the surrounding context isn't there, right? So that's why we started talking about object-oriented operations, right? The idea that that database over there is an object and it's the same class, it doesn't matter who's running it, it doesn't matter where they're running it, it's exactly the same class, right? And that means that code to drive that will work exactly the same way, even in completely different environments. And that leads to this idea of class libraries. Libraries of code, which should work for anybody, anywhere, right? So complete reuse of operational code. Just like when you sit down to write uh, an application, you can import class libraries and expect them to just work, whether you're writing for Android or the web or iOS or Windows, Linux, doesn't matter, right? You can use class libraries and expect them to work the same way. Why can't we have operations class libraries that just work in any environment? So it starts to look like this. We learned essentially that we needed to actively facilitate reuse in this community. When we, when we started out, we thought it was most important to give everybody complete freedom to do all of their operations in whatever language they wanted to do. Right? The idea being that giving people as many choices as possible would empower them to make the choices that they liked and then they would write better code because they were working in the choices that they liked. When we went the other way, when we essentially said, okay, we're only doing this for ourselves, we're only doing this for this one use case, right? we took a simple decision, which is that we said, well, screw it, we're just going to do everything in Python. And so suddenly what emerged was reusable code in the same language across all of these different um, communities or parts of the community. So if you're writing a client application to talk to Redis, you can essentially just say, let me use the class library to talk to Redis and I will just do the part of the configuration management that's specific for my application once I already know everything that there is to know about Redis. So Python all the way down. The other thing that's kind of happened in those, in those couple of years has been the emergence of multi-cloud controllers. So when Juju started, you had to have a different controller for each place that you were building a model. Now you can essentially have one controller that can see and work in lots of different places and build models in lots of different places. That's much cheaper. It means you put all your HA eggs in one basket and observe it closely. Um, but perhaps more importantly, what it lets you do is connect those different environments really elegantly, right? So now I can build a model in one cloud that's doing something that I want to do on that cloud. And I can build a different model in a different cloud that's doing something that for whatever reason I prefer to do in that cloud. And by connecting the models, I can essentially exchange all the information that needs to be exchanged dynamically to allow those two things to effectively integrate and talk to each other without even really being aware of the fact that the other end of that connection is on some other cloud. So where does that get us to, right? So with Maz, Maz, we have internet issues, so I'm not going to show you um, Maz. Um, Maz essentially turns bare metals into a cloud, right? I can on-demand just get machines and ask for them with Windows, ask for them with CentOS, ask them with Ubuntu. Um, uh, with Maz, I can then 
use Juju to build a model of OpenStack, so I get an OpenStack, and I can then use Juju to build a model of Kubernetes, so I get a Kubernetes. Um, obviously, there's a gap there. And so one of the things that we've been working on is to essentially use Juju to build a model on top of Kubernetes. So what we're modeling there is Docker containers instead of machines. And because of cross-model relations, we get the ability to essentially deploy stuff on Kubernetes that wants to be on Kubernetes and connect it to stuff not on Kubernetes that, for whatever reason, doesn't want to be on Kubernetes. So I want to show you a little bit of that. Um, I'm going to use something called microcates. Who's, who's heard of microcates? OK. So microcates is a snap of Kubernetes. Right? So if you have an Ubuntu machine, 16 or 18, you can go get yourself a Kubernetes with the right command. As easily as that. So that's a Kubernetes, it's full upstream, CNCF, all the binaries. And I'm going to enable storage and DNS. So essentially, I've now stood up Kubernetes as a, um, uh, as a single package. And I've enabled uh, um, a bunch of services on top of it. So if I just do a kubectl, you can see those things are running on Kubernetes. So I'm just going to go over to another machine where I have a Kubernetes running. And I'm going to watch. So I'm watching Kubernetes running, right? Nothing's running on Kubernetes, just storage and DNS. And I'm going to I also have an empty Juju model, like a blank canvas, on that Kubernetes. And with a little bit of luck, I'm going to deploy MariaDB and GitLab on top of Kubernetes. Right? So I just deployed a charm. That's the MariaDB charm. And you can see the Juju status in the top right, basically, showing me that the Juju model is essentially settling down with that database. Let me go deploy GitLab. And so essentially in, the, in that picture language, I've got an, uh, uh, a circle, which is the database. And I've got a circle, which is, the, which is the GitLab front end. And now I need to draw the line. Now I need to connect those two. Now. You'll see that that GitLab case up there says that it's blocked. It's blocked because it knows that it needs a database, and it knows that it hasn't been told yet where the database is. You can see stuff running on the Kubernetes now on the left. When I relate, whoops. When I relate those, wow. you'll see it happens quite fast. You'll see Juju, the Juju model, effectively settling. And so now a bunch of operational code is running on top of Kubernetes that's essentially exchanging messages between that, the operational code for GitLab and the operational code for MariaDB. And it's done. So now essentially GitLab is up and running. MariaDB is running up on Kubernetes. You can see on the left-hand side, you can see all of those different processes running on Kubernetes. So, this very simple, clean modeling language, which gives us very reusable operational artifacts, now works not just on machines, but also on top of Kubernetes with Docker images. And with cross-model relations, I can connect those. So I can essentially deploy stuff on machines. There's a Hadoop. And I can deploy stuff on Kubernetes. And then I can relate those things and effectively have them connect and exchange information. So just to wrap up, I wanted to show you Maz, the latest version of Maz. For those of you who operate bare metal, Maz is awesome. And I, uh, I, I 
I hope you give it a, give it a try. There's a bunch of serious institutions now starting to use it as essentially um, the data center control plane. It does compute and storage um, really, really beautifully. Um, recently, it got support for ESXi, so you can essentially deploy uh, VMware uh, in the data center with MAS. It also got full support for CentOS, CentOS storage, so you can effectively configure all the storage for CentOS machine deployments. LDAP integration, scalability, high availability, and microclouds. It got the ability effectively to create VMs as well as deploy physical machines. So for people who've got a half rack or a single rack and who don't want OpenStack effectively, just using MAS25 will give you whatever operating system you want on bare metal, but it will also give you the ability to create VMs on that bare metal as a little cloud. Thank you very much. I hope that was helpful. And on Wednesday, those of you who are interested in OpenStack will do the afternoon session uh, and we'll deep dive into the OpenStack operation story with those charms. And in the morning, we'll do Kubernetes. So we'll deep dive into those Kubernetes charms and deploying Kubernetes that way, either integrating with the, with the cloud SaaS effectively or in a, in a creating standard topologies across different cloud environments. Thanks very much. <laughs>